Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 21st century where all technology depends on batteries. Thank you so much for being here today. If everybody could um, silence their cell phones, that would be greatly appreciated. And thank you as we managed a uh, overflow crowd today. We appreciate your patience. Um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Max Nosbish, our education manager, and welcome to everybody who's Zooming in from around the country. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hingham Historical Society's Revolutionary War Patriots of Hingham, author talk with Ellen Miller and Susan Wetzel. My name is Max Nosbish, and I serve as the education manager at the Hingham Historical Society. And we're thrilled about this new book, and we are equally excited that so many people are here with us today to learn more about the people from our town that served in the revolution. It really does encourage us to see a full house like this and know so many people here are passionate about our town's history. Really, it means a lot. We're so grateful for all of you and for all your support. And shamefully, I have to admit, however, that it wasn't until the other day that I uh, really realized the immense importance of this book. I woke up to a late night email from my boss, Hingham Historical Society Executive Deirdre Anderson, who is on stage today. And the subject line said, I just had a moment, dot, dot, dot. And it was about how she realized that the day she sent that email uh, was the same day uh, of a birthday of a 17-year-old Hingham patriot who had unfortunately died while imprisoned by the British in Halifax during the revolution. And I hate to admit it, and this is probably revealing how callous I am, but I didn't really understand what she was getting at other than that it was an odd coincidence. It wasn't until later that day that I understood what she truly meant when she explained to me how emotional it made her knowing that a 17-year-old soldier from Hingham wasn't forgotten and that his sacrifice and legacy of service was still remembered 250 years later. And that is the power of this book. Susan and Ellen have rediscovered over 850 people with ties to Hingham who risked their lives and their property to secure our independence and help usher in an age of revolution around the world. And as the Philadelphia Patriot Charles Thompson wrote, a new order of the ages, a phrase still found on the seal of our country. These were ordinary people of our town who threw tea in the harbor, who answered the call at Lexington and Concord, who marched with Washington, who challenged the world's greatest navy on the sea, and who faced down the most disciplined army in the world on land, who served long, boring days on guard duty around Boston Harbor, who froze, who suffered, and many who died. But their service and sacrifice secured our town and our country its liberty. And now, thanks to the work of Susan Ellen, their names will never be forgotten. This event is part of the Hingham Historical Society's larger Rev 250 commemoration. We kicked it off this past December with our Boston Tea Party Party at the Intercontinental Hotel in Boston on the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Through 2026 and beyond, please stay with us for more events, programs, and opportunities catered around the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War. On March 23rd, we invite you back to the Heritage Museum for our commemoration of the second Boston Tea Party. Probably didn't know there was a second Boston Tea Party. Well, now is your chance to learn all about it and enjoy some coffee. Coffee, because we're boycotting the tea, remember? Um, other events coming up include Lincoln Day this coming Saturday the 10th with remarks by Michelle Marchetti Coughlin on Mary Cushing Lincoln, the wife of General Benjamin Lincoln, followed by National History Day on the 11th and a, hist a Hingham History Makers event on March 24th about Hingham's oldest continuously operating business, Gordon Building Movers. And that'll be with Eileen McIntyre. All of these events are free and open to the public. That's right. They're free. And how can we offer so many free events? Of course, with your support. Please, if you haven't already, join us here at the Hingham Historical Society as members. 
Our members are the lifeblood of our nonprofit membership supported organization. So if you haven't joined uh, today, if you haven't joined, please, after today's talk, go down to the first floor. There'll be information on membership and staff who can get you easily signed up. There are all sorts of benefits to being members, things like tour discounts. You can take a tour with me, ticket discounts to future events, longer notice and registrations for programs, and so much more fun stuff. And membership has never been more important than now as we head into our Rev250 commemoration. So help us bring more stories like the ones you're going to hear today to life by joining us as members, please. And without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Executive Director Deirdre Anderson, who will introduce today's speakers. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Max. And hello to everybody also in our visitor center. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for coordinating everyone down uh, downstairs. Sarah Doggett, our uh, director of marketing. And to thank you, Colin, our technical genius back there. And thank you, Max. You are not callous. Um, we're honored today to uh, be joined by two Hingham Historical Society members and neighbors and authors, Ellen Miller and Susan Wetzel. Ellen is a Pennsylvania native that loves Hingham history. She taught mathematics and computer science before transitioning into professional development. As someone with a lifelong passion for genealogy, she is a member of the Colonel Thomas Lothrop Old Colony chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. In fact, she's so passionate about genealogy, she teaches it to others at the Weymouth Senior Center. She's also an integral part of the Hingham Historical Society operations, not only as a member, but as the volunteer coordinator for the Old Ordinary House Museum, the Hingham Historical Society's original headquarters, and a house built by Ellen's seventh great granduncle, Thomas Andrews. In this role, Ellen coordinates our volunteer Old Ordinary tour team, refreshes our field trips and tours every season, and loves that, as, loves that home as if it were her own. A recipient of the Historical Society's Judith Kimball Award for Volunteerism, Ellen is a once-in-a-generation volunteer, a legend at the Hingham Historical Society. Susan Wetzel is originally from the South, but she moved to Massachusetts in 1969 and has lived in Hingham for 43 years. Susan received a bachelor's degree from Eastern Nazarene College and a master's in education from the University of Massachusetts at Boston. She worked as a registered nurse and also grew interested in genealogy. She is a lifetime member of the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Mayflower Society. She is a past regent of her local DAR chapter and is an active parishioner at New North Church. I'd like at this time to personally welcome and thank Susan and Ellen's families, since we all know the cheerleading you receive at home is often the fuel needed to complete big things. Susan's college sweetheart and husband, Larry, and her daughter, Rebecca, and Ann Mahoney joining us online. Also online are Susan's relatives, Dean Murray from Indiana and Phil Murray from Maryland. And Ellen's family, husband, Wayne Miller, always with a smile on his face, and a, a longtime volunteer with the Quincy Historical Society. And Ellen's many family members online, including William Stein and Betty Zanziger from Pennsylvania, and the Bala family zooming in from Acton, Massachusetts. The Hingham Historical Society is deeply honored to be Ellen and Susan's first stop on their book tour. Well, thank you, Max and Deirdre for that. And I think I can go home now. I think they've done it. <laughs> Get hooked up. Susan and I are exceptionally glad to be here today not only because it finally marks the end of a five-year marathon to get this book done, but also because we're so excited to share what we've learned with you. And I'm going to echo the feeling expressed by Gordon Carr at the most recent lecture here, that we are preaching to the choir in many cases as I look around this room. There are people in this room who know a whole lot more about Hingham and who know a whole lot more about the Revolutionary War. As you've heard, Susan and I are both transplants to Hingham although we love it here, um, but we don't have the depth of knowledge that others do, and neither of us, of us began, out, began as an historian. Uh, but what we bring you is the gift of our time, our interest, and our shared doggedness to get all of these names in one volume that we can use as a reference. 
So how did we get started? Well, five years ago, Susan led the local Daughters of the American Revolution chapter that serves both Hingham and Cohasset. And as is tradition, she sought a project that she could complete within her three years. Notice the three years. <laughs> she attended a conference at which Ann Dillon, who was then president of the National Society of the DAR, and Dillon, uh, she spoke and challenged Massachusetts to remember the sacrifice, passion, and wisdom of the American Revolutionary War patriots. And she suggested some ways that that could be done. And one was to locate the graves of the patriots and ensure that they were decorated with flags. Sounds simple, right? Surprise. <laughs> she met with Keith German, who's here on the front row. Keith, you want to wave? <laughs> He's uh, the director of veterans services for Hingham. And Keith gave Susan a sense that her project might be bigger than she thought. So having learned that, she wondered if there were other people who were as oblivious to Hingham's role as she was, and she started an informal survey. She asked people how long they'd lived in Hingham, and especially if they'd been here for a while, she asked them how many patriots they thought there might be and encouraged them to take a guess. And many came in at about 20 to 50. One person guessed 400. In fact, Walter Bouvet estimated the number at about 600. Bouvet wrote the military chapter in volume one of the history of the town of Hingham, Massachusetts, a major reference for our book. And I think, is his grandson here? He's online. He's oh, online, okay. <laughs> Hi to Jonathan online. Um, in a different context with a more uh, expansive view of the town's effort, he actually raised that estimate to 750. It's amazing. So Bouvet's chapter is a remarkable history. It includes rosters, resolutions, expenditures, stories, and more. And he also provides background on why this project is difficult, why we can't find the information we're looking for. But he did include rosters, and among those, he, uh, he, he gave the ones, the four companies that went to the Lexington Alarm on April 19, 1775. And I want you to know on that one single day, 154 men marched from Hingham in four companies on one day, 154. Susan knew my interest in genealogy and she asked for my assistance in forming a committee to carry out her project with two goals. One was to identify the Hingham uh, Patriots and the second was to promote awareness of their contributions to the American Revolution. In the end, it was a committee of two and we embarked on our journey and we have to say we were supported by very, very supportive husbands and very patient, thank you. So we quickly learned that we were following in the footsteps of an earlier DAR committee. Um, prior to the two chapters of Cohasset and Hingham joining, a committee of Henrietta Hillis, whose grandson Matthew is sitting here in the front row. Matthew, raise your hand. <laughs> yes and another woman named Catherine Lewis. In the archives of the DAR, we found a 1972 booklet that, that had the names of 465 patriots that they had identified. It was amazing. Think about the technology in 1972. We don't know why they did it, but they might have been preparing for the 200th anniversary the same way that we're preparing for the 250th. In any event, it represented an auspicious start for our project, but lacked some detail and was far short of the 600 to 700 names that were projected by Bouvet. And so we began and immediately ran into issues. The first was, what are we going to call a patriot? Each of these societies, the DAR and the Sons of the American Revolution, recognizes service beyond that which is military. Their rules are in the book, in the back. They include civil service, and that's any official governance once we had thrown off British rule. So any office, like selectmen, obviously, or constable, but also fence viewers and hog reeves. And I'll let you figure out what a hog reeve is if we had to look it up. Patriotic service. That includes things like participation in the Boston Tea Party or being on a committee of correspondence or signing the Declaration of Independence, but it also included supplying a wagon to carry gunpowder or any other support for the war, even if you were reimbursed for that activity. 
Now that last category made it a little bit easier to enroll women as patriots, but it's still extremely difficult and that's something we can get into later if you'd like. The 1972 list among their 465 did include some men who were not there for military reasons, but for patriotic and civil. It's interesting to consider the Sons of the American Revolution uh, definition, which includes the words at all times unfailing in loyalty. So given how rapidly attitudes changed just as we were getting ready to go to war, one can understand that someone might start out as a loyalist and end up as a patriot. Could you still be a patriot if you came late to the game? The DAR is a little bit more, a little bit different. They have a most recent act. So it was okay to waver as long as you ended up on the right side. <laughs> so think about Benjamin, uh, Benedict Arnold. He certainly started out as a patriot. And if you just missed that little bit at the end, you know, <laughs> but he certainly wouldn't fit under either rule. But I like to consider one of our favorite loyalists, and that would be Elijah Levitt, who supported the British, launched the Battle of Grape Island that we celebrate annually. In fact, he was later reimbursed for providing barracks for troops near Broad Cove. And he proposed a contract to provision the French from Gallup's Island, which he owned. An argument could be made that his descendants qualify for DAR membership under his service. Although since his two sons were patriots and his daughter married one, they could be there anyway. The second quandary was how to define Hingham patriots. Did you have to be born here, died here? What if you lived here recent, uh, briefly? What about people from Cohasset? Because they were Hingham when they were born before 1770, but after 1770, when they officially separated, it was Cohasset. Bouvet cast a wide net when listing who was from Hingham. Just seeing how many of the people are named Bates tells you he included Cohasset in his count. Some lived elsewhere like Weymouth, but they might've married here or had some other connections and Bouvet might've considered them family. What about those whose only link was that they were hired by Hingham to fill their quotas? And then there are some that we can't identify, perhaps because their names were terribly misspelled, if anybody knows who Ezra Glenn Millery is, please let me know, but he's in the book. We finally concluded that the only way forward was to focus on a comprehensive reference rather than a definitive list. We would include everyone with a connection between patriotic military service and Hingham and do research to find additional names to try to get to that 750. We would also include those already in the DAR roles for non-military, civil, and patriotic service, but not do research to find others. And there are 26 of those in our count. Our sources expanded on those used by Hillis and Lewis. Of course, we had the advantage of personal computers and much better access to information. The history of the town of Hingham, Massachusetts, and that's the books shown up there and on the table here. If you don't know them, you must, they're wonderful. They were published by the town in 1893, and they provided the foundation for our work. Volume one includes the military history chapter written by Walter Bovey that we talked about already. Volumes two and three are the genealogies written by a man named George Lincoln. In addition to those, the DAR role of ancestors can be searched online by anyone. The 17 volumes of the Massachusetts Soldiers and Sailors, that tells you a lot, is available online. Pension records are stored at National Archives, but they can be accessed by some paid subscription services like Fold3. And we also simply read widely and researched widely wherever we could. We do have to say that sometimes it was very difficult to tell if we had the right person. And that's why when we were reading in the genealogies and we saw these words that George had written, we were so happy. He was a soldier in the war of the revolution, huzzah. <laughs> <clears throat> the bulk of our work, some of you already have it and probably have flipped through, has 857 sketches, some of which are very brief and some are longer. They all contain where we know it, a description of the service, brief biographical information, selected sources and notes. So we're going to walk you through a sketch so that you can see how, it, how they look. David Andrews is fairly typical and please forgive me for picking a family member. Those of you can see, David Andrews was a fifer and a private. He served under the three captains who were listed and the two colonels. 
He was born in December of 1757 in Hingham. So if you think about that, he wasn't yet 18 at the time of the Lexington alarm. He was the son of Thomas Andrews and Deborah Burr. He married Sarah Thaxter in 1781, just before the war officially ended. He died in 1847 in Hingham at the age of 89. Continuing with the sources, this information is based on an entry in the Massachusetts Soldiers and Sailors, that's the MSS, volume one, page 246. In the history of the town of Hingham, Massachusetts, that's HTHM, volume one, which is a military chapter on two different pages and also in the volume two genealogies on pages 13 and 14. He's also recognized as an ancestor by the DAR and his number is given. In the genealogies, George Lincoln wrote that David was a trader, a selectman in three different years and resided on North Street. His gravestone is in Hingham Cemetery and there's a listing and photo of it on a crowdsourced website called Find a Grave, that's FG. In his listing, we also include his portrait, which is part of the society's collection. Now the sources are listed, so you can go ahead and do additional research on your own and see what other information might be there. Here's what some of those look like. If you look up in MSS, David only has one listing. Some men have several, and believe me, we searched every possible spelling we could to try to find them. You can see that there are three brief periods of service, each consisting of just a few days, and they were early in the war. That's fairly typical for some men. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the only service, but those are the only extant ros rosters that we could find or that they could find. Here's a page from the military chapter. You can see it includes a transcribed roster giving David Andrews as a fifer. This is a listing in the genealogies. It indicates that David, there's a tiny little seven behind his name. That means he was a seventh generation resident of Hingham. And then it has Thomas 6543. So it was son of Thomas, son of Thomas, son of Thomas, son of Thomas, son of Joseph, son of Thomas. It provides names of his parents, biographical information about his wife. That's important. That's the only place where you find out about women. The notes previously mentioned about his work and residence, and it lists his children. And finally, we have a listing in the DAR roles, and some additional lineage information might be available there. Now, we know that for some of you, interest in the book is going to boil down to, did my people make the list? <laughs> and we cannot go through that for everybody because there's 857 names. But one thing that Bouvet did was to tout the contributions of some families to the patriotic cause. Indeed, when we looked at some families, every son was a patriot and every daughter married one. It's amazing. So on the list, you'll find the number of men he identified for familiar surnames in order by how many there were going down to seven from the family. And in parentheses behind his number are the number that we found. And we were relieved that in all but three cases, we had as many or more than he did. We missed a couple apparently, or he counted people differently. So Lincoln, there are multiple Lincoln families, you know, but there were 48, we found 60. Uh, Cushing, there were 37, we found 39 and my eyes are bad, going all the way down to the, at the end, we have the Fearings and the, and the Thaxters and the Barneses and the Marshes. I think they had 11, seven, nine and 11, something like that. So I'll give you a minute to quick search. So there were two areas in which we really tried to be more inclusive and do some additional work. The first was women. Recalling what Abigail Adams asked of her husband, remember the ladies, slightly different context, but note that Abigail herself is not enrolled as a patriotic ancestor in the DAR, despite all that we know about her contributions. We do include two women recognized by the DAR for patriotic acts, both from Cohasset, a mother and daughter, in hopes, and in hopes of expanding interest in women's contributions, we've created an index of the wives of the patriots by their maiden names, for people to identify additional ways in which they might be connected. So go check out the appendices as well. We also took inspiration from the work of both the Hingham Historical Society and the DAR in focusing on people of color, including both African-American and Native American people. The DAR some years ago undertook an attempt to identify the estimated 5,000 people of color who fought in the revolution. The result, a book called Forgotten Patriots is available online and lists a number of men from Hingham. 
We were able to connect them to work done by the society and add more names ourselves. And here I need to give a big shout out to Paula Bagger. <laughs> Raise your hand, Paula. <laughs> She has led much of the society's research in this area. In fact, when I thought I was done, just a couple of days before I pushed send to the publisher, she got in touch with me, put two and two together and suggested that we include Britton Nichols. She was right and we did. So beyond the list of names, how does this work contribute to our understanding of Hingham and the war? As we were researching, we had any number of aha and wow moments and we started jotting down ideas. Some revolved around age. Could this be the right person? Isn't he too young or too old? Note that under militia and army rules, we were already looking for people born roughly between 1715 and 1765. And some went beyond that. We were saddened as Max and Deirdre indicated at how young some people were when they died. And we were astonished at how old some lived to be. We gained some insights into the various roles the people from Hingham played and the toll on the town. And then there were just some interesting stories. So here are a few statistics to get us started. Of the 857 names, we have births and deaths or close estimates on 638. Of those half or 319 actually lived out their lives in Hingham, if you count birth in Cohasset as part of that. Then beyond that, there's an assumption that people died young in colonial times. But research shows that if you made it through those early years, you stood a good chance of living a good long life. Of the 638 for whom we had birth and death and therefore age when they died, a full 193 lived to be 80 or more and 40 lived to be 90 or more. It was amazing. We kept saying, can't believe it, but it's true. So the 15 pages of introduction in the book explain more about our work, some of our insights, share a few stories, and we hope the lists and the insights will be a springboard for more projects. In fact, Paul is deep at work creating a profile of Hingham in 1776, and our work is helping her to match patriots to the homes in which they lived. It is incredibly exciting work, and I, I just can't wait to see how it comes out. It will probably never end. So I'm going to end my overview here. And we're ready for some conversation with Deirdre and with you. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. And thank you, Max and Chloe, for giving us a, uh, doing some house touring. Thank you. That is a heck of a research project. And uh, no wonder it took five years. Um, but let's start out with our conversation um, for my first question to you both as we commemorate the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. Did you know your timing would be so perfect? <laughs> no, that was not the original intent at all. We did have a conversation about the upcoming 250 and Ellen jokingly said to me, it'd be really great if we strung this out. And we're like, no way. We are going to finish this book. We thought we would finish it in about maybe a couple of years, although Wayne and his wisdom says it takes longer than you think to write a book. <laughs> and so uh, as it turned out, we had a little thing called COVID jump in there. And uh, just a lot, of, a lot of work, but a lot of family things that, you know, took place. So no, we never <laughs> and here we are. Can you all hear Susan? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. We had to test her audio. Thank you. Did you know your uh, timing would be so perfect? <laughs> what she said. <laughs> Ellen, you mentioned in your introduction that there are a lot of individuals with amazing details. Who was the oldest or who was the youngest? You want to take the oldest? The oldest was, uh, it was amazing how many old ones there were, but Obed uh, Dunbar was the oldest in 98. And, and he, Jacob and also. Jacob Dunbar also. Mm -hmm. so those two were our two oldest in 98. But there were us, uh, it was uh, Abel Kent was 96. So he was another old guy. And then Sprague, it was uh, Samuel. Samuel Sprague, who actually lived 
long enough to have his photographs. So, wow. <laughs> I know it's pretty, and there is a picture of him in the book. So uh, it's pretty amazing. He joined young and lived long. Mm -hmm. And youngest. So I like to talk. We actually had a couple that were very young. Uh, Thomas Berry's probably my favorite. He lived long enough to file a pension, and those were wonderful. So in 1832, in his pension, um, this is the first time you could count militia toward your years. And he said that he was 15 when he enlisted at the age in, in 1777. So you could do that if you had permission of your parents. We checked his birth and baptismal records. They jived. He was actually 12. And we're not sure. He said that he knew he was that old because it was written in a Bible. I don't know if they did that so they didn't come back and check with the town because they would check for proof of birth um, or if he really didn't know. But the other thing is that actually there was a Thomas Berry on the rosters in 1776. So either that was his father or he started at 11. Um, yeah, we have a number who joined with like their fathers as fifers, and they learned the how to be a fifer, and they joined at twelve or thirteen. So we had a couple in that category actually. It's amazing, yeah, fascinating. In the same vein, on details, when you had men of the same name, how did you decide which of them was the patriot? And did any of your findings overturn previously accepted identification of patriots? So. The first thing to find out was if we had two people or sometimes three uh, with the same name, yeah. might there be two people serving? And you could find out that there were, for instance, two of them were on the same roster or otherwise had overlapping service. So then we know we're looking for two people. I mean, you really, really hope that they're going to have a pension record or something else, or they're going to have the magic words. He was so, <laughs> um, but we couldn't go to the genealogies often. Um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that here. We did go to the genealogies. Um, we looked for all kinds of information on them. Um, often there was something that would, would trigger. So for instance, John Beale is a case study that we have. There is a John Beale recognized by the Daughters of the American Revolution, and he is from Weymouth, but his father was born in Hingham. And so we, he served from Weymouth, but we consider him a Hingham person on our rolls. Um, but we have John and they claim that he, he marched on the alarm. Well, the people who marched on the alarm were part of the Hingham militia. And there is a John Beale living on South street who would have marched on the alarm with James Lincoln. So people put in for the John Beale of Weymouth, but there is a little flag on the DAR roster that says, there's something about Weymouth and Hingham here. Check it out. And I believe that they have the wrong guy. I believe it's the other. But it's one of the things about lineage societies that won't be picked up unless somebody knew files as a descendant. And then they would take another look at the record. They don't routinely do that, but they will flag things that maybe need a look at the next time. Thank you, Ellen. One of the sub themes. Oh, I, I, oh, I should oh, say, got more. Sometimes yeah. we truly didn't know. And when you go through, you'll see and or because we couldn't determine. So I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> More opportunities for research. Can you hear me okay, Max? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so just a little bit louder for our friends at home. Thank you. Okay, great. One of the sub-themes as we commemorate the American Revolution in the 21st century and America's 250th birthday in 2026, of course, is our unfinished history in this country and the stories of those who have typically been left out of the historic record. Why is it so difficult to include women as patriots? And what did you do to forward that goal? Coverture. There's a doctrine called coverture, which basically says women do not have agency. They are always under the guidance of their husbands or their fathers or some other wise gentleman. <laughs> and you take a look at somebody like Abigail Adams. How long, how much of the time was she alone? How much of the time was Mary Cushing Blanken alone managing the house and making decisions as much as she could without having to write to her husband? Um, but it was a very strong doctrine and very difficult to under, undertake. Um, for instance, women didn't own property. Even when their husbands died, they didn't own the property. They got the use of the house as long as they were his widow. So um, that's, that's one of the things that makes it very difficult. 
and you wanted to talk about, so what, what did we do? Oh, so it was, it was, that was a source of frustration for us as many things were, but basically what we did is we specifically, we looked and searched and found as much as we could. And uh, we had an online source. We looked at graves. We looked within the books for Lincoln and, so we created the, in the end, we created in the, the end, index. the the most important thing, I think, in terms of what came out of that was that we created an index in the back of the book. And that index in the back of the book identifies the women. And that's a rare thing that you can find today when you go to a genealogy book, that they are specifically identified by their maiden names. So we hope that that will give people an opportunity to go to the back of the book and look at these names and do further research on these women, because frankly, being in the DAR, we know how difficult it is to find our history as women. And uh, so we're hopeful that people will use that. They'll continue it here and hang them and even across the country to begin to establish that. But that was the way it was. And, you know, history is based on the male name. Thank you. And then what about people of color as patriots? Well, so that's where we couldn't just pick up the genealogies because they're not in there, um, if you think about it. So where are they? They showed up on rosters with usually the name Negro behind. We did not find any people who were Native American, um, but we did know that there were a number of people who had the word Negro behind and we could look them up. But very often, all they had was a first name. And the first names were basically given by owners of enslaved people. And they like naming them things like Caesar and Squire and Prince and Plato. Um, so if you have multiple people by that name in one town, how do you distinguish one from the other and, and find those records? So we found them there. We found them in Selectman's Minutes. Um, and again, Paul is really big on this. Eileen's done a lot of work in it too. I know there are other people who are. Um, Sometimes they took surnames. So we have Squire who took the name Cushing because he was uh, the servant of Peter Cushing. Um, we have uh, Joseph Falmouth, who yep. was given the name of the town that he came from in Maine, what's now Maine. So um, we did the best we could and we hope to find more, but or even to fill out the lives of the people yeah. that we do know. And, and when you came across Freeman, we were frequently, they were called Freeman because they were free. So uh, that was really very, very hard. I don't think there were that many people of color, you know, at that time. But even if they were, you know, to find record of them was really difficult. Thank you. What personal interest story sticks with you? I'll ask you both this question. You want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, there are so many, really. But the one that that really stuck with me was a woman by the name of Ruth Joy. And Ruth Joy um, lived here in town. And when Ellen and I were doing the research on her, she says, Susan, did you realize that Ruth Joy was single and yet two of her children served, actually one child served in the American Revolutionary War. So we had a woman by the name of Ruth Joy who was a spinster who lived here in town, who had her child. And we do not know who the father of the child was, but she, he lived here. He fought in the American Revolutionary War and his son fought in the American Revolutionary War. And I thought it was remarkable that the same things that are going on, we don't know what happened that she was a spinster and had children. We don't know if she was, you know, any of the details about that, but it was remarkable that she lived out her life here in town, was accepted into the community, and and then Alan said, yeah, and she lived right here. So apparently that was her home right here next to the building. So, so she did. Yeah. <clears throat> so mine is a little more complicated and also a little bit more about the, um, telling you, things haven't changed. Not all has changed, right. Mm -hmm. Not all has changed. Yeah. Um, one of the other people that was difficult to figure out was Laban Stoddard. And how do we pronounce it? Laban or Laban? Anybody know? Stoddard is Laban. Okay. Laban's daughter. So again, there were two of them. Uh, one was born here in Hingham and one was born in Situate, but moved to Hingham. And the one uh, did not have descendants. And so he has never been 
in the DAR, That's even it. though I believe that some of the service uh, that that belonged there probably belonged to the guy who didn't have any descendants. There actually were two service records, one as a seaman and one as a uh, private. And the sons of the American Revolution assigned one of the one of the sets of service to the guy, and the DAR assigned the other, the other set of service to the guy. So what's really interesting about this man is that he did move to Hingham, where he married um, Persis Wilder and had six children by her at the same time that he was having an affair <laughs> with Celia Sprague and had six children with her. <laughs> And for some reason, Persis finally got fed up and left his bed and board. <laughs> I have no idea why. Um, Celia went on and had seven more children with the man. And they finally got married in 1795 <laughs> after, the, after the divorce went through from the first one. So just really interesting. Yeah. Um, so careful about the pedestal that we put some people on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you anticipate future research or commemor commemoration projects that this book might support or suggest to others to undertake for research? Well, I would, uh, first of all, we feel like it's a gift to the town. So it's really the people of the town and Hingham that decide how they want to use this. But a couple of things that we would like to see, or I would like to see would be maybe an emphasis on the curriculum that they that the town really acknowledges what the the forefathers of this town the sacrifices they made how many people really did serve I I educated three kids here in town and and I don't remember that but then again they've been out of high school for a while but I think in that would be important that would be one thing and then what else did you have in mind Lynn well there's there already are projects going on and I'm I'm just going to bring up Paula's again. Um, we had the rosters of the men who marched in the Lexington Alarm. And one of them was under uh, James Lincoln, one of them was under Enoch Witten, and one of them was under Isaiah Cushing. And it said where they, the, the three companies marched and it said where they marched from, but it didn't say which was which. Well, Paul is creating the street address thing. So I said, I'll go look at Paula's list. And it fell out beautifully. I could actually match People's addresses said, okay, this is the Broad Bridge group. <laughs> they, they marched from downtown. Okay, this is the group that marched from Hingham Center because all of their addresses were right there. And this is the group that marched from South Hingham because all of their addresses were there. And it just, the, the two projects marry so well, and I think they will push each other forward along with other things. It's just, it, it doesn't end what we can do with the work. We would like to see the houses also. I mean, you, yeah, yeah we'd like to see the houses that, uh, the Patriots lived in or built and somehow have that. I mean, it's just fabulous. You'll never look at the town the same again. I did ask Ellen and Susan if they now drive around town selling, oh, hey, Laban. Hey, <laughs> I know I do. Excellent. Ellen, tell <laughs> us about your genealogy coupon and other ways people can learn more. Where'd my coupon go? Ah, Okay. So you notice I've been talking about pension records and I might've mentioned wills and other kinds of things and they're not in the book. There was no, no way that we could put those stories in the book, but I do work on ancestry.com and I have some of those things. I have kind of a, a working tree that I keep all kinds of things attached. So if you bought the book at the Hingham Historical Society, you got a coupon, a bookmark. And on it, it says that if you have a patriot you're interested in, I will give you a half hour of my time to pull those resources up on that on that Patriot and tell you, we'll we'll set up a quick meet and I'll let you know whatever, whatever dirt I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's wonderful stuff, especially if you hit a pension record. It's just amazing what you can find. It is. Yeah. So um and the, and, I, and that if you're talking about projects, that will be one of my major projects to forward the work is to continue to work with people on on connecting with their patriots. No better time. No better time. Thank you. Right. And that's very generous. And for a closing mm -hmm. question, what was the most surprising thing you learned or how has this work changed your view of Hingham and the American Revolution? Go first. You want me to go? Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> well, being in the DAR, we're fortunate enough to go to a lot of different towns and see the history that they have there. And uh, I was always puzzled when I went to some of these towns to see what they had and the people that were involved. And, and I was, this was early on, I was like, you know, Hingham has got to have their share of soldiers. They just have to. And so that was always kind of like in my craw that, that we didn't have spelled that out. So the biggest surprise was that we had not identified them prior and that the town really didn't have as a whole town the, the tremendous pride that some towns seem to have. And, uh, and so I'm very hopeful that this will be a robust kind of thing that we can say, yes, our town played a huge role in the forming of this company, of this country. And uh, it was a real eye opener for me. I wasn't raised here, but I just felt it in my bones. So yeah, go hang them. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually went around looking for plaques that people had to see if we, of course, now we just said we can't come up with a definitive list. So there goes the plaque. Yeah. But um, yeah. for me, one of the things I had looked at was, you know, the number of patriots we had, but also the number of loyalists we had. We were, if you go down North Street, you see lots and lots. We actually have a little map that shows who's a patriot, who's a loyalist, who, you know. Um, and yet, as I read through what I did and knowing how things were in other areas, when it came down to it, the town was really all in. Yeah. Um, looking through the minutes and seeing, okay, we have to support all these soldiers in the field. It's yeah. going to cost us this amount of money. This is what we need to collect. Constables go out and get it. And they did. It, it's astonishing yeah. to see the, the sheer amount of money, the amount of beef that went out, the shoes, the canteens, the blankets, mm -hmm. all of these things going out to support the troops. When we couldn't get enough people, we put enough money into the kitty that we were able to hire to meet our quota and beyond sometimes. Other towns could not do that. Mm -hmm. So, and in the end, we came out pretty whole as a town. Yeah. Um, and I think that is something to be proud of, that we somehow all managed, for the most part, there, there obviously were some people who weren't all in personally, yeah. but as a town, uh, made it through yeah. stronger than ever, I think. So I think that's really, that that's what touched my heart. Yep. Thank you. That's very powerful. Thank you. All right. Well, I um, want to thank Ellen and Susan so much for giving so generously of your time, of the investment in your last many years. I do think you have given us this great gift at a time where we will be thinking about the American revolution and the 250th of this country. Ellen and I had a chance to talk about how lucky we are to have this resource. And then you fast forward into the 19th century with Hingham's multi-volume of who served in the Civil War. And then of course our role with both in the 20th century as a munitions and shipyard and right through with the work that Keith does every day with our veterans and our active military, including the town being awarded in 2015, a freedom town by the Department of Defense. Um, I think that's a long history to be very proud of. And thank you both so much for uh, illuminating this, this initial moment. So with that, we are going to take questions from the audience. We have a robust group on Zoom, and we have a group both here on the third floor and in the visitor center of the Heritage Museum. So we're going to start here on the first floor. A couple um, caveats, please. If you have very specific questions about your patriot, um, <laughs> we welcome the opportunity for you to talk to the authors um, about that during the genealogy hour, but we're happy to take sort of general questions here or share anecdotes if you'd like um, during this Q&A uh, session. Does that sound like a plan? Excellent. Any questions in the room? I was watching uh, Ted Burns, Benjamin Franklin thing the other night and noticed that his son uh, was a loyalist to England until the end of his life. And I wondered if you came across uh, patriots whose 
other family members did not share their um, look, were not patriots. No, oh, pretty much families hung together. We, we had some mixed bags. We didn't actually look at it. You know, we were more looking for the patriots rather than the loyalists. Um, we certainly had families, like we said, where everybody was everybody in, in. But right. then there were names that were were missing, where certainly the men were of the right age to be enlisting. So we don't know why. Um, there was one, and I can't think of the man's name now, who uh, the genealogies say was a loyalist, and yet his name shows up, and I can't find anybody else who who, who it could be who served. So um, did, did he do it under duress? I don't know. But no, that, that that didn't show up as part of what we were doing. Really. No, it really wasn't. It's a good question. question. It is a good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. But mostly families were in. They supported each other and, you know, it was a unit. Mm -hmm. Max, you want to give us a question from the Zoom audience? Yes, absolutely. And thank you to everyone on Zoom who has so many questions. Uh, the first question I have from Jim Glinsky is, uh, is a really good one. Something I was wondering, too. Did you find any sailors from Hingham? Oh, yeah. Or people who served in the state or continental navy or as privateers. Yes, we did. There's quite a few seamen. Um, the men who served on the protector and the hazard, they had the roles. And so those are pretty much listed. Yeah. Uh, there were a number of people in the privateers, and that's not as easy. They, you know, you don't have those lists. But yes, there were quite a few yeah. that we have evidence who served. Few. And many of them just served on the seacoast. Uh, protecting the seacoast. I was always amazed to hear that when they were protecting the seacoast. That was, that's where we were and that's where they, they were. But yes, we definitely had uh, sailors. Would we not expect that in hang on, right? <laughs> Anyone here in the audience? Let me just bring the mic to you. So everybody, oh, you can take Max's. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, my name is Tom. Uh, could you tell me what the population of Hingham was during, during the Revolutionary War? Thanks to Paula, in 1776, it was 2,148, of whom 61 were people of color. And the other interesting stat that I asked her for the other day was how many of them would have been of the age, which would be 16 to 60, to be required to be available for the militia, and that was 530. Another question. Were there any killed in action from Hingham during the war? Yes. Yes, they were. Yes. And we don't always have a count. Um, I think I have a number that we were able to identify in the introduction, but there were a number of men who died during the war. And um, okay, here's another statistic 70,000 people are estimated to have died in the war. Of those, only 7,000 are believed to have died from wounds sustained in battle. The rest died of disease. And of those 11,000 died on prison ships. So yes, but think of that um, smallpox and all kinds of other diseases ran rampant through the troops, so. And we were, at times we were not able to find out where they died. Right. So we don't know. And then they were not, a we just didn't have the records. That wasn't always. Just we we knew when they were born, but we didn't always know know when they died. Another question from Zoom. Yes, um, this one's from Phil Murray. Thank you, Phil. What was the most difficult time for you with all this project? Did you ever consider giving up? <laughs> <laughs> and sorry, that's from Mac Murray. Thanks, Max. <laughs> that's my cousin. I knew he would do that. <laughs> <laughs> so he knows the answer to this. <laughs> um, I will say there were dark days during COVID when it seemed, at least I can only speak for me, it seemed like, why are we doing this? Um, but uh, I would say, and then there were other dark personal times that it just seemed like it should be in the back, but it always moved forward because of Ellen. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was really kind of cool because she would she would go, oh, can't do it. And and I would move forward and then I would say, uh, and she would. So it was you know, we, we set ourselves goals and it worked. And you can hear she's the passion, I'm the data, you know, and, and we needed both. Couldn't have done it without her. And I shouldn't say that. She's the one who went through 
put all of Bouvet's chapter and kept finding names oh, embedded in paragraphs. We kept apologizing to itself. We, you know, we thought we were done and then we'd say, I'm sorry, Susan, I found another one. <laughs> <laughs> it, I would say if anyone wanted to undertake a project, what you really need is two people that can work together that complement each other. Mm -hmm. And that really is, that is really the best way to yep. achieve it. And yep. because we're not writers, you know, I was a nurse. And Ellen was a mathematician. mathematician. So, you know, it wasn't like we started out in English and said, we will write a book. We never said that. <laughs> right, we have a question here. So uh, great that you were able to find more women to include in the book. So thank you for making that effort. Um, using your expanded definition, how did Ruth Joy fit in as a patriot, other than having a son and a grandson that served? Ruth was not identified as a patriot only the mother of a patriot and the mother of a of her grandson. So she really mothered only one, but the women were not recognized as that. That was just my recognition that women. If if somebody would like a project, then it's going to oh, take yeah. things like going, <laughs> yeah. going through selectmen's minutes and looking perhaps for widows who yeah. uh, made blankets for the war effort or something like that. So they coverture might go away a little bit and it, it, or reading diaries, and, and we don't have enough, I mean, historians know that, we don't have enough diaries and journals and letters from women, but that's what you need. You need to be able to identify a specific act that they did on their own, and it's tricky to do. Yeah. Coverture is very strong. And speaking of Ruth Joy, if you look out that window over Ellen's shoulder um, at the home of Rich and Karen Young, that back garage is likely the structure that Ruth Joy and her children lived in or was yeah. part of their property. So little inspiration every day for us. Yeah. Max, you got some questions on Zoom? Yes, I have a question from Anne. What did service entail for people who stayed local? That is those that served in Hingham. I do if that question mm -hmm. makes sense. Yes. Well, protecting the seacoast right. would be, you know, and they had duty there. So that would be what any serviceman would do, which would be you know, watching the seas. And, and that was a very big part of, I think, after, uh, you know, the British left was to make sure. So that would be a big part of what duty was here. Yeah, um, it, this is kind of fun. I, I realized this late in the game. Again, reading back through Bouvet and, and what he said, um, about 150 people, he estimated, went and worked on the, um, the army, basically the... Uh, the Continental Army, thank you. And of those, he estimated about only 80 were from Hingham, which almost is exactly what we found out. We found out about 75 or 80 people, about half of the 150 were people who had been hired. And I said, wow, <laughs> that's really neat. Um, other militia, so that was the Continental Army. Then we had the Massachusetts line, which mostly stayed local and guarded the coast and did other kinds of things like that. But units would be called out, as I understand it. I'm not a military person, yeah. but as I understand it, units would be called out. So, for instance, we had units that were called out to go down to Rhode Island and uh, fight the British there on secret missions. And um, But a lot of what they did was local, guarding the coast and, and preparing right. uh, and taking care of that. And that was a large, think about how large the coastline is. Mm -hmm. Because they were out, you know, quite a ways. So it was it was not the way it is today. Any other questions from the room? Got any? Would would someone have qualified if they were making canteens for the troops and only doing that? I think it might depend on when they made them. <laughs> it's interesting. The um, other than the other than the Tea Party, I think service starts in seventeen seventy five with the Lexington Alarm. So if they were produced. Uh, before that, as they were as they were putting supplies away, uh, and, and I hadn't really thought about that. But if they were doing it before the supply, as the supplies were gathered before the Lexington alarm, they wouldn't be covered under the timeline. Uh, if they did afterwards, then they would be. I think so. Interesting question. Yeah. Thanks. I think we have a couple questions in the back. Uh, uh, my question is for the Historical Society. After you locate some of the house where the Patriots live, might you make it an effort to get them on the uh, on the house tour? 
Why, yes, Kim. Thank you for that plug. I swear I didn't ask him. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kim Dunning. Yes, we obviously, if you received a letter from us that said, guess what? You live in the home of a patriot um, and you're willing to open up your home to the world, um, we would be very grateful. Our 2024 house tour is on September 29th, and we will focus on revolutionary houses as we will in 2025. So thank you, Kim, for that plug. Yes, Mark. How did you ID the house with the patrons? How much time do you have? <laughs> There's a historic inventory. Um, yes. yes. So the question from Mark was, how do you ID the house with the Patriot? And that certainly starts with the work of Andrea Young and the town's historic commission. Andrea, you want to give a little wave? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have Ellen talk about the historical inventory produced by the town of Hingham. And then if Paula is willing, she could give us a little preview of what she's been doing with the 1776 census. I'll just let people know that if they want to look it up online, all you have to do is Google historical inventory. I think it has the AL if you look up historic. So hang on historical inventory and there's a database online that lists um, homes that are have been identified as being of historic interest. And it gives the exact date or an approximate date of when it was built, by whom it was built, or sometimes not by whom it was built, but by how it's known now. Um, and it was it's just wonderful. So of course what we did, we looked for homes that were built by Patriots. So some of the houses that are in the book, photographed in the book, uh, were built after the Revolutionary War. Right. Some were built before. What we did not know what we did not do, which is what Paul is doing, um, is to look at who where were they living in 1776. Right. So if Paula wants to talk about that, that'd be great. <laughs> so much fun. Well, in terms of resources, the really short answer to the question is that in the 1970s, a gentleman named Julian Loring did yes. uh, a Amazing. phenomenal piece of research, which is in probably 100 three ring binders in our archives. And I think it's also at the Historical Commission, correct, on microfilm, um, on essentially all of the houses of a certain age in town. Um, so that is, uh, feel free, if you want to know more about your house, come to the Historical Society or go visit Andrea and we can show you the, the Loring record for your house. Um, and John Richardson uh, also contributed to that work with some of his material. Uh, what I'm trying to do, which they've referred to a couple of times, is um, uh, there was a census in 1776, a colonial census of the town and it lists 385 heads of households and how many people were in their house and what race the people in the house were. What I'm trying to do is um, flesh it out and figure out who those people were and to the extent the house is still there, where were they living? Amazing. And I have a, a question from Zoom or waiting for the mic to get back in the room. This is from Scott Stevenson. Did you locate any letters written by any of the Hingham participants in the Revolutionary War effort? Uh, if so, are they in the book? And can you tell us about what the soldier might have wrote? We did not. Um, I do know that <laughs> recently there was a, a, a journal by Benjamin Beale that was that went on the auction uh, that we, <laughs> we, we thought we might be able to buy. It didn't happen. Um, and we we do have some papers in the collection. That that's not something that we actually looked into, but that's another thing that that should be done uh, to really inventory. I, and I think people have done it from time to time, but I I don't know that it's been done as a project to say let's let's look now at Revolutionary War. On the same note, Ellen, if you found their pension record, yes, okay, that was often written in their words of what they said, what happened, and. We have identified for the Patriots that we could find. We have their pension number, so you can go and read it. I know that my, I think it was my fourth great-grandfather, Maxim, who's from the western part of the state, I was able to find his pension record, and some of the things that he wrote was amazing. 
because it was quite long and uh, wanted to tell you all kinds of things. So uh, really, when you read those old pension records, they uh, if they lived long enough to, and got a pension, that's very, very informative. All right. I think our last question, because I think he might have run over here from next door, is from Rich Young, who lives in Ruth Joy's house. So, our <laughs> <Lord of it. laughs> so please tell me I got part of that right, Rich. <laughs> Uh, you did. I think she's uh I think she actually might have owned the house somehow. Yes. Um, I think you mentioned that uh women at that time didn't own things or houses or stuff. So she owned the house. Yes. Um right. so that was a cool fact. And we have a little bit written about the history at our house in the spring. I apologize, but um yeah, it's it's great living next door to you guys and um we've done our best to try to keep everything, you know, historically sound and it's uh, it's quite a battle, but it's fun. If, if I could, Deirdre, that's the house that it, some of you may remember that Richie Garrison gave a talk a while back about the uh, Benjamin Lincoln house, and, and they were here studying our old homes. And he and I were going out the back door, and he looked at that, and he stopped dead in his tracks, and he went, oh, my gosh. And he had to go over and look at the house. It is indeed that old, according to him. So it was really fun. Well, thank you. One more question, Dorothy? Uh, there was a comment uh, earlier about further research. The and I don't know if I ever told you this one, but the uh, Tea Party Museum mm -hmm. in Boston has a similar kind of research project that's ongoing. And what they do is to try to seek out, and usually people like people from the Historical Society in Cohasset, for example, and other people um, may like to wander through. Uh, cemeteries and so on. But their project is if they find the grave of someone that has been identified as a patriot, they send out uh, a cotillion from the museum, usually some of their uh, uh, artists, meaning their um, the reenactors, I was going to say actors and actresses, mm -hmm. but they send them out and they come to the cemetery. I went to one of these ceremonies in Colasset about mm -hmm. three years ago, and they come in costume wow. and they yeah. come with a little plaque mm -hmm. that they leave. Uh, and usually they leave it with the historical society because, of course, the the, uh, the heirs of, of all of these people who are buried there uh, are probably non-existent. And so there aren't any of those people in cemeteries in Hingham. It doesn't mean that there aren't any who were buried here, but names could have changed. Uh, they could be in an unidentified uh, a grave or whatever. But anyway, it's an interesting project. And so pretty much they had intended it to be a project that was just kind of local. But other people found out about it. And just recently, just before the um, the reenactment uh, that we had back in December. Um, they went to uh, New York. Somebody there knew about the project. Somebody there had a relative that was buried. And so they sent yes. a group there to do the reenactment little ceremony. So I don't know whether there's any connection between names or, but for the project for someone like you, Ellen. <laughs> there you go, Ellen. I've, I've got my coupon. <laughs> yes, Dorothy is talking about the Tea Party Descendant Program, and you can see it at December16th.org. Sorry to prolong this, but Mr. Young inspired me. I've got this captive audience of people who have old houses in Hingham, love and study their old houses. I would love for the project I'm working on, and on behalf of the Historical Society, Anything that you can share with us that you've done about your house would be deeply appreciated. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Yes, thank you so much, Paula, because those will become the bagger binders. So, <laughs> the bagger binders. So, so, we'll have the Loring binders and the bagger binders. Um, so, without further ado, thank you, Ellen and Susan. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
please, please join us downstairs. We have lots of refreshments. And if you'd like to purchase a book, please do so on the first floor of the museum. And then you can come back up to the second floor where the authors will be signing books and you can enjoy refreshments. Thanks so much for coming.